Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Today I'm going to read A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. This is a, a dear little short story about Christmas in the deep south in the 20s. Imagine a morning in late November, a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature. But there's also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, the fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She's wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly, like a bantam hen, but due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that and tinted by the sun and the wind. But it's delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry colored and timid. Oh my, she exclaims, her breath smoking the window pane. It's fruit cake weather. The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven. She is 60 something. We're cousins probably very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not on the whole too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy, a member of her boy, who was formerly her best friend. The other buddy died in the late 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with purposeful excitement in her eyes. The courthouse bell just sounds so cold and clear. And there are no birds singing. They've gone to warmer country. Yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuits and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to bake. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination, and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. The hat is found. A straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses. It had once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together, we got our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine. That is, it was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it's a fateful object. Springtime, we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild ferns for our porch pots. In the summer, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and roll it down to the edge of a creek. It has its winter uses too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen and as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived distemper and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is tr trotting beside it now. 
Three hours later, we were back in the kitchen, hulling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find the main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us, by the way. Among the concealing leaves, the frosted deceiving grass, crackle, a cher cherry crunch, scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and the golden mound of sweet, oily, ivory meat mounts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now again, now and again, my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. We mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop, and there's scarcely enough as there is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dust turns the window into a mirror, our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final hull into the fire and with joined sighs watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty. The bowl is brimful. We eat our supper cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best, buying cherries, citrons, ginger, vanilla, and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins, walnuts and whiskey, and oh, so much flour and butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings, why we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any, except for skin flint sums persons in the house occasionally provide, and a dime is considered a fortune, or what we earn ourselves from various activities, like rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries, jars of handmade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once we won 79th prize, five whole dollars, in a national football contest. Not that we know a fool thing about football. It's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested capital A, capital M, and after some hesitation, for my friend thought it was perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan, A-M, A-Men. To tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the fun and freak museum we conducted in the backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington and New York, lent to us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we had borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabouts wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel and kids two cents and took in a good $20 before the museum had to shut down to the decease of the main attraction. But one way or another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient beaded purse under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. 
The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit or, as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I'm allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way, I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except funny papers and the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished somebody harm, told a lie on purpose, or let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, however. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county. 16 rattles. Dipped snuff secretly. Tamed hummingbirds, you tried, to balance on her finger. Tell ghost stories, we both believe in ghosts. So tingling they'd chill you in July. Talk to herself, take walks in the rain, grow the prettiest japonicas in town, know the recipe for every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical wart remover. Now, with supper finished, we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently, wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills, tightly rolled and green as may buds, somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weight a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters, worn smooth as creek pebbles. But mostly a hateful heap of bitter, odored pennies. Last summer, Others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. Yet it was not work in which we took pride. And as we sit counting pennies, it's as though we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall or put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13ths in bed. So to be on the safe side, we subtract a penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruitcakes, whiskey is the most expensive, as well as the hardest to obtain. State law forbids its sale. But everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address, a sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before, and on the same errand. 
But in previous years, our dealings have been with Haha's wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxided hair and a dead tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too, a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Ha Ha because he's so gloomy, a man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish, gay, naked light bulbs and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade trees where moss drifts through the branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Ha Ha's Cafe. Cut to pieces. Hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings on at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns and the Victrola wails. In the daytime, Ha Ha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls, Miss Ha Ha, madam, anybody to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts turn over. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself, and he is a giant. He does have scars. He doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan-tilted eyes and demands to know, What do you want with Ha Ha? For a moment, we're too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like to buy a quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruit cakes, Mr. Ha Ha, cooking. Well, this sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars! We pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, jangling the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruitcakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. The black stove, stoked with cold and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin around in bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air, ginger spices it. Melting, nose-tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, and drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, our work is done. 31 cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on windowsills and shelves. Who are they for? Friends. Not necessarily neighbor friends, indeed. The larger share are intended for persons We've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who have struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt, like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, Baptist missionaries to Borneo, 
who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year, or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud swoop, or the young Wistons of California, a California couple whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and who spent a pleasant hour chatting with us on the porch. Mr. Whiston snapped our picture, the only one we have ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and mere acquaintances seem to us our truest friends? I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we could keep of thank you notes on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders penny postcards make us feel connected to eventful worlds beyond the kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now a new December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty. The cakes are gone. Yesterday we carted the last of them to the post office where the cost of the stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me. But my friend insists on celebrating with two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle. Weenie has a spoonful in a bowl of coffee. She likes her coffee chicory flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed up expressions and shudder shoulders. But by and by, we began to sing, the two of us singing different songs simultaneously. I don't know the words to mind, just come on along, come on along to the dark town strutter's ball. But I can dance. That's what I mean to be, a tap, tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls. Our voices rock the chinaware. We giggle as if some unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls over on her back, her paws plow in the air. Something like a grin stretches her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, carefree as wind in the chimney. My friend waltzes around the stove, the hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. Show me the way to go home, she sings, her tennis shoes squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Enter two relatives, angry. Eyes that scold, tongues that scold. Listen to what they say, the words tumbling together like a tune. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath? Are you out of your mind? Feeding a child of seven must be loony. Road to ruination. Remember Kate, um, cousin Kate, Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law? Shame. Scandal, humiliation, kneel, pray, beg the Lord. Weenie sneaks, sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her shoes, her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt, blows her nose, and runs to her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent, except for the chimings of the clock and the sputtering of the fading fires. She is weeping into a pillow, already as wet 
as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering, despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry, I beg, I teasing her toes, tickling her feet. You're too old for that. It, it's because, she hiccups, I am too old. I'm old and funny. Not funny. Fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be so tired tomorrow, we can't go cut a tree. Straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed where she's not allowed to lick her cheeks. I know where we'll find a real pretty tree, buddy, and Holly, too, with berries big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, further than we've ever been. Poppy used to bring Christmas trees from there, carrying them on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. Well, now, I can't wait till morning. Morning. Frozen rind lusters the grass. The sun, round as an orange and orange as hot weather moons, balances on the horizon, brandishes the silvered winter woods. A wild turkey calls. A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth. Soon, by the edge of knee-deep, rapid-running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie we wades in first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current and the pneumonia-making coldness of it. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet and a burlap sack, above our heads. A mile more of chastising thorns, burrs, briars that catch at our clothes. A rusty pine needle brilliance with gaudy fungus and molten feathers. Here and there, a flash, a flutter, an ecstasy of shrilling remind us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinding through lemony sun pools and pitch vine tunnels, another creek to cross, a disturbed armada of speckled trout froth the water around us, and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the further, farther shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold, but enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal, petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. We're almost there. You smell it, buddy? She says as though we're approaching an ocean. And indeed, it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly-leafed holly, Red berries, shiny as Chinese bells. Black crows swooping upon them, screaming. Having stuffed our burlap sacks with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about choosing a tree. It should be, muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy, so he can't steal the star. The one we pick is twice as big as me, a brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it kneels with a creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a keel, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen that and the tree's virile, icy perfume revives us and goads us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town. But my friend is sly and non-committal 
when passers-by praise the treasure perched in our buggy. What a fine tree. And where did it come from? Oh, yonder ways, she would murmur vaguely. Once a car stops and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines, Give you two bits cash for that old tree. Ordinarily, my friend is afraid of saying no. But on this occasion, she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar. The mill owner's wife persists. A dollar my foot, 50 cents. That's my last offer. Goodness, woman, you can get another one. In answer, my friend gently reflects. I doubt it. There's never two of anything. Home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps until tomorrow, snoring like a human. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of ermine tails, off an opera cake, cape that a curious lady who once rented a room in the house left behind. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age. One silver star. A brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous, candy-like light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze like a Baptist window, drooped with weighty snow, a weighty snow of ornaments. But we can't afford the made-in-Japan splendor at the five and dime. So we do what we always have done. We sit for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketches. My friend cuts them out. Lots of cats. Fish, too, because they're easy to draw. Some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved-up sheets of Hershey bar tinfoil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. As a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effect, clasps her hands together. Now, honest buddy, doesn't it look good enough to eat? Queenie tries to eat an angel. After weaving and ribbering holly wreaths for all the front windows, our next project is the fashioning of family gifts. Tie-dyed scarves for the ladies. For men, a homebrew lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first symptoms of a cold and after hunting. But it, when, when it comes time for for making each other's gift. My friend and I separate and work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl handle knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries. We tasted some once, and she always swears, I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could. And that's not taking his name in vain. Instead, I'm building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She says so about a million times on different occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want. But confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Only one of these days I will, buddy, locate you a bike. Don't ask me how. Steal it, maybe. Instead, I'm fairly certain she is building me a kite, the same as last year and the year before. The year before that, we exchanged slingshots, all of, all of which is fine with me, for we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a kite aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. 
Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butchers to buy Queenie's traditional gift, a good, gnawable beef bone. The bone, wrapped in funny paper, is pla placed high on the tree near the silver star. Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the front of the tree, staring in a trance of greed. When bedtime arises, arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equal by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching summer night. Somewhere, a rooster crows, falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? My friend calling from her room, which is next to mine, and an instant later she's sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hoot, she declares. My mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Miss Roosevelt will serve our cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed, and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Seems like your hand used to be so much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you're grown up, Will we still be friends? I say always. But I feel so bad, buddy. I wanted so bad to give you a bike. I tried to sell my cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, she hesitates, is so embarrassed. I made you another kite. Then I confess that I made her one too, and we laugh. The candle burns too short to hold. Out it goes exposing the starlight, the stars spinning at the window like a visible caroling that slowly, slowly daybreak silences. Possibly we doze, but the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water. We're up, wide-eyed, and wandering while we wait for the others to awaken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of closed doors. One by one, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both, but it's Christmas, so they can't. First, a gorgeous breakfast, just everything you can imagine, from flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the cone which puts everybody in good humor except my friend and I. Frankly, we're so impatient to get to the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Who wouldn't be with socks, a Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year's subscription to a religious magazine for children, The Little Shepherd? It makes me boil, it really does. My friend has a better haul, a sack of plums. That's her best present. She's proudest, however, of a white shawl that's knit by her married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. And it is, a very, be and it is very beautiful, though not as beautiful as the one she made me which is blue and scattered with gold and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it, Buddy. Buddy, the wind is blowing, and nothing will do till we run to the pasture below the house where, Ke where Queenie has scooted to bury her bone and where a winter hence, Queenie will be buried too. There, plunging through the healthy, waist-high grass, we unreel our kites, feel them twitch like at the string like skyfish as they swim into the wind. Sat satisfied, sun-warmed, we sprawl in the grass and peel plums and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we've already won the $50,000 grand prize for that coffee naming contest. Oh, how foolish I am, my friend cries suddenly. 
alert like a woman remembering she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I've always thought? She asked in a tone of discovery and not smiling at me, but a point beyond. I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagine that when he comes, it would be like looking at the Baptist window, pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through. Such a shine, you don't, you don't even think it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think that shine takes away all the spooky feeling. But I'll wager it never happens. I'll wager at the very end a body realizes the Lord has already shown himself. As for me, I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school and so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim, reverie-ridden summer camps. I have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie, then alone. Buddy, dear, she writes in her wild, hard-to-read script, yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture where she can be with all her bones. For a few Novembers, she continues to bake fruitcakes single-handed. Not as many, but some, and of course she always sends me the best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show and write me the story. But gradually, in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more thirteenths are not the only days she stays in bed. A morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning, when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim, Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when it happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein has already received, severing from me an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. That is why, walking across the school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky as if I expect to see, rather like hearts, a lost pair of kites hurrying towards heaven. Thank you.